All right, let's say a short prayer before we start. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for today. We thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice. I ask, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you give everybody a fresh outpouring of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the mighty name of Jesus, I ask that you speak through my mind and think through my mind and speak through my mouth. I ask that your word comes forth in accuracy, in boldness, in power and the wisdom of the Spirit of God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so welcome to church. Um, today is part three of our Logos series, and uh, from the beginning of the series, we started looking at how to study biblical poetry, right? So in the first service, we had talked about... Um, what did we talk about in the first service now? We did parallelism in the second service, right? So the first service was just like a basic intro, Yes, yes. So the first service was the basic intro where we looked at poetry, how it makes up most of the Bible, and then why have I forgotten the order? So the first service was parallelism. I think the second one was metaphors. Yes, it was metaphors. Second was metaphors. Thank you. Then um, today is the third um, service, and we will be looking at three books of the Bible that are literally termed wisdom literature. They are commonly termed wisdom literature. Right. And um, why we are looking at these three books is because it's partly because I want us to sort of like change our approach a little bit. So what we've done for the last two weeks is we have analyzed how to look at the scriptures in their little detail, like line by line and try to make sense of each line. So we use metaphors as a tool for that. Parallelism also works as a tool for that. But um, for today, we are going to look more like from a broader perspective. Right. And think about it like we are studying an elephant. Right, it's possible that I'd open up the elephant, right? I point to the liver and I show you how to locate the liver, how to locate the bladder, how to locate the heart and stuff. But um, you might know all the details, but if we don't piece everything together from like up, right? You are not going to know that, okay, this is an elephant as a whole. So what we want to start doing going forward um, as far as poetry is concerned, is we'll start looking at books that contain a lot of poetry and then we'll take that holistic approach and use that you know, to now guide how we study because um, the context, the broader context always affects the local context as well. Um, so let's go on. So wisdom literature, today we are talking about three, or we are looking at three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job, right? Um, these three books, the interesting thing, one interesting thing about these three books is that um, they don't look like they fit in the storyline of like the rest of the Bible. So if you are reading your Bible from Genesis, for example, and you start from, you know, Genesis 1, man is created, and then man falls, chapter 3 happens, chapter 4, Cain and Abel. You go on up until, like, Israel's story, when they are formed, the covenant at Sinai, you know, all that, all those landmark events you go into, um, when they eventually settle in Canaan, when they go into exile, they return from exile, like, all of that stuff. It doesn't look like it fits. So, um, somebody who is reading the Bible from Genesis might be wondering, okay, so, what's the point of, like, all those books? And... One thing we are sure of, even though it doesn't look like it doesn't contain the, it doesn't follow the narrative exactly. One thing we are sure of is that um, the writers of these books, right, actually assume that the God of Israel is the true God, and you know they have all that um, the oppression of the God of Israel as revealed in the rest of the Old Testament. So we are sure that it's the God of the when they say God, we are sure that they are referring to the God of the Bible. So it's not a different, um, that's a different God. Now, two of these books are connected to Solomon in some way or the other, which are Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Right? But Job is not connected to Solomon at all. We'll go into the details um, as we go on. And in terms of like what is unique about these three books as well, these three books try to answer one question, or let me see two questions. The first question is, what does it mean to live right in this world? The second question is, so what should I expect if I live right? right? And these three books sort of offer you different perspectives to answering this question. So in um, so you think about it like you are looking through a prism, right? And depending on the side which you look through, right, you might see something a little bit different, but they all come together to tell one message, right? One interesting message. So I want you to buckle, don't tighten your seatbelts. It's about to be a right. All right, so let's go through the book of Proverbs. That's the first one. Um, so when you think about the book of Proverbs, um, who wrote the book of Proverbs? I mean, it's very easy to say Solomon, and you might not be wrong, right? Uh, so Solomon is not the sole author 
but Solomon is referenced at, at least three times. And you know, in the poem, he says, These are the words of Solomon, and then he goes on. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Proverbs 1 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. Good. Um, let's also look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. It just gives you a header there, the Proverbs of Solomon, right? Cool, that's Proverbs 10, 1. And then the last is Proverbs 25, verse 1. Proverbs 25, 1 says, These also are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, transcribed. So Solomon, even, so even though I would say that Solomon did not write the entire book, he is quite recognized as one of the primary you know, authors or contributors or people who even put the book together. Um, so there are other people who are actually credited as, would I say, as sources. I would not say as co-authors. I would say as sources from the book as well, right? Um, let's look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17. Amen. Proverbs 22, 17 says, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your mind to my knowledge. Now, it says the words of who? The wise. The wise there is plural. You get so it's it contains words that existed in their culture from other wise people, right? So Solomon was not the only wise man. Of course, we know the story of how God blessed him with wisdom and knowledge and all of that. Uh, so he became very wise and he was the wisest person. But there were other wise people too who had wise things to say. Um, so in so there's a large section of Proverbs 22, 17 up until 24, 34, that is these words of the wise, right? Um, but let's read Proverbs 24. Verse 23 as well. It also refers to these wise. It says, These are also the sayings of the wise. To show partiality in judgment is not good. Right? So you see that. So we have seen, we have identified Solomon as one source. We have identified the wise. We don't know who these the wise are, but you know that they are the wise and they existed in Solomon's time, right? As the next source. Um, the third source is somebody called Agor. That's in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 1. It says, The words of Agor, the son of Jake, the oracle. The man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Uka. So, he's recording the words of somebody called Agor. We don't know who this Agor is because we don't have more detail in scripture, but we know that Proverbs chapter 30 is the words of somebody called Agor. And in chapter 31, verse 1, if, if we have the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. So in Proverbs chapter 31, what we have is the record of somebody of a certain king who is recording the wise things that his mother taught him. Right? Good. Um, so that's so that's it with the authorship of the book of Proverbs. We have Solomon, we have a group of people called the wise, we have Lemuel, we have Agor, and all of these people, their words come together to form this book of Proverbs. Now let's talk about the structure of the book, right? So the structure of Proverbs, Proverbs actually starts with nine chapters of what I would say speeches, right? Um, not, necess not necessarily the actual Proverbs, but you have like nine chapters of speeches, right? From a father to his son, right? Then the rest of the book is now the actual Proverbs themselves, right? So the, in, the first, um, in the first nine chapters, there are two things that really stand out. And like these two things provide you the framework for reading the rest of the book of Proverbs. One is a concept that we are all family, familiar with called wisdom, right? Um, I don't know how many times the word wisdom is used in the book of Proverbs, but it's a lot. It's used a lot, right? And um, wisdom is presented in different, um, would I say, faces, right? One of the primary ways that wisdom is introduced to us in the book of Proverbs is that it is the, I mean, for lack of a simpler word, it is the fundamental principle that guides how everything is ordered, how the universe is ordered. You get, so wisdom is that thing that underpins everything else, sustains everything else, runs through everything else. So if you think about all of creation and all the universe is like a piece of cloth or fabric, right? Wisdom will be the thread that sews everything together. You get it, it's just that, it's the thing, it's the principle that guides the oppression of everything. Let's read Proverbs chapter eight. Proverbs chapter eight, uh, will show us clearly. Proverbs 8, from verse 22 th to 31. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. It says, The Lord possessed me, some transitions have it as acquired. 
Um, so the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there was no depth, I was brought forth, where there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he created the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed the circle of the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he sets for the sea its boundary, so that the water would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman. So wisdom is also presented like a co-creator in this process. As a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. I see that. So wisdom is personified, meaning he speaks as a person. <clears throat> Actually, in, in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is presented as a woman. So wisdom is personified as a woman. Wisdom is also identified as a co-creator. Right? But more importantly, wisdom is, you see, it is the principle that ties everything, that holds everything together. The order of the universe, the laws that sustain the universe being in shape and not falling apart, right, is wisdom. So when you think about wisdom, uh, we will get into the, the, because wisdom also has a moral context to it, right? Uh, but before we get there, wisdom is also presented as something that God has or as an attribute of God, right? So God has wisdom or God is wise. But the good thing is Proverbs presents wisdom as something that man can also have or partake of. Right, so you are encouraged. I, I, I mean, the scripture that comes to mind, it talks about us pursuing wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom always is crying out in the in the in the in the in the open, saying, you know, embrace me, blah blah. But point is, man can also partake, or man can also have wisdom, right, and partake of this quality of God that God has, right. Um, so let's speak about this moral context to it a little bit, right. So. When it comes to, if you read the book of Proverbs, one thing you will see is that the wise are always, you know, contrasted either with the foolish or the wicked, right? You always have that wise, words like wise, righteous, upright, etc. are contrasted against like wicked, the evil man, the foolish man. And so, so you see that wisdom there is also presented to you as like a moral concept. And, and why is that the case? Um, that leads us to the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the second thing, right? That um, that also is the second principle. So I said there are two things that form like the foundation for how you read the book. One is wisdom. The other is the fear of the Lord. Now, so the fear of the Lord is what so is, is, is the component of this wisdom that sort of supplies or amplifies this morale side of things. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. Proverbs 1 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's parallelism there. But the point is, what, what I'm trying to emphasize here is, it talks about the fear of the Lord being the beginning. So if you want to have wisdom, the beginning or the foundation of fearing the Lord, or sorry, the foundation of wisdom is that you fear the Lord. So if somebody has any type of wisdom, but is not undergirded by the fear of the Lord, it is not wisdom, right? I will actually, I, I jump something, so I will go back to it in a bit. But, you know, it's, it's not treated as wisdom, right? And let's read Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it's the same thing again. Fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. Now, I made a certain statement just now where I spoke about having a kind of wisdom but not having the fear of the Lord. Now, wisdom is presented to us also, right? I'll just, I'll just go back there. Wisdom is presented to us also as skill. It's translated the word skill in a number of places. But the idea of wisdom is not just, you know, you know the way we think about wisdom. We think about wisdom as something that a person is just in a person's mind. And when he says something, wow, he's so wise. You know, that kind of thing. Like, ah, this guy is wise, he's wise, right? But, but the idea behind wisdom is not just a mental thing. 
Wisdom also has a practical side to it. That's why it's referred to as skill. So let's read Exodus chapter 36. Um, Exodus 36, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Bezaliel and Oholiab, and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put chokmah, chokmah is a word for wisdom, put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work in the construction of the sanctuary. Bezaliel and Oholiab, and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put chokmah, that's wisdom, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work to what? Perform it. Are you seeing that? First Chronicles 28, verse 21. First Chronicles 28, 21. It says, Now, behold, there are the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God, and every willing man of any okma will be with you in all the work of all kinds of service. The officials also and the people will be entirely at your what? At your command. So people who have wisdom are also like skill. The word skill in those verses is, is, is the same word as wisdom. So a person who demonstrates, so if you are a very skillful musician, for example, that's a demonstration of, that's wisdom at work, right? So I was trying to make a distinction between wisdom that has a fear of God and wisdom that does not have a fear of God. So let me give you an example. Imagine a person was a very great financial expert. Like, you know the market, you know all of that stuff, you know what's going up, you know what's going down. But, so, so in that case, you have hokma, right? You have hokma for financial management. You are good at that. But even in that process, you are now defrauding people. Wisdom doesn't call you wise. Wisdom calls you foolish. You get because even though you have a plan for this, it's not undergirded by the fear of the Lord. Yes. So this fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord is not, it's not really about you know, hey, God exists and I'm afraid of Him. No, it, 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 it is the kind of knowing that first informs you that there is a God and you are not Him because that's important. Many people think they are God. Yes. So first of all, the first thing about the fear of the Lord you must know is that God exists and. Thankfully, beautifully for all of us, you are not him, right? Because if some of you were God, hey, wahala. But thank God you are not God, amen. So that's the first thing. And the next thing is this moral concept. So it is that knowledge that there is a God and you are not him. Is that thing that informs this moral outplaying of wisdom such that you know that, okay, there's a way that wisdom expects you to relate with people. There's a way that wisdom expects you to interact with people. You get to, that's, that thing there is a hair. That's, that's, that's what the fear of the Lord does. So a person who is skilled at plumbing, for example, but will inflate prices for his clients, right? Has okma for plumbing, but he's not working according to the fear of the Lord. So we can't say he's working according to wisdom, right? Wisdom is also the principle that does what I would call reward, like that, that controls like the reward system of the earth. So for example, a person does right, well, they are compensated for what they do. A person does wrong, so they are punished. That's also, a, it's part of that, you know, earlier on I talked about the, the principles that un undergird the operations of the universe, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's also wisdom. Wisdom is gravity, right? You jump, you come down. Wisdom is, is, is still wisdom. Everything, right, everything that forms a principle for how the world is designed to function, right? It's wisdom, right? So um, that's, that's, so that's, there's wisdom and then there's the fear of the Lord. So I want to read a verse to you that puts these two concepts in one verse or that, that puts these two concepts together. And then we can now have, so you can form the competence. It's like you are wearing glasses and you have one side and you know, if you read one without the other, you don't, you're not going to see properly, right? So let's read Proverbs chapter three, verses five to seven. Proverbs 3, 5 to what? 7. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. So are you seeing that? So he tells you about, so he says, Trust God, don't lean on your understanding. Acknowledge him. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of parallelism going on here. But acknowledging him, you will make your path straight, and then don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from what evil. So if there is no fear of the Lord and turning from evil, you are being wise in your eyes, and that's not the Okma of God. I see. So, uh -huh. so that verse is what shows us. So these two uh, sides of the of the glasses, I'll call it that. 
that we have from the first section of Proverbs, that's Proverbs chapter 1 to 9, is what we now use to read the rest of the book, which is like the main section. So there's one section of Proverbs 1 to 9. The next section is Proverbs 10 to 29. Is it making sense so far? Am I, I'm not rushing, Abi. You are, you are following me. Good. Um, Proverbs 10 to 29. Now, Proverbs 10 to 29 is the section, in fact, the whole book of Proverbs. It looks like just, it looks like a book of tweets, you know. Um, if you use Twitter, like it looks like these guys were just tweeting these things because they're just short lines and it just, you know, you know, word, word, ba, ba, you know, you just pa, 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 pa. But basically, um, in the main section of Proverbs, what you have is the is the authors try to, or the author tries to apply the concept of wisdom to every area of life or as many areas of life as possible. It talks about marriage and relationship and sex and work and money and, you know, nature and community, life, forgiveness, alcohol, death, anger, you know, everything. It actually does touch on a lot of things. So Proverbs tries to apply Hopma, which is, you know, this wisdom of God with the fear of the Lord to all these areas of life. And the way Proverbs expresses itself is that if you fear the Lord and you make wise moral choices, then good things will happen to you. That's how Proverbs speaks. You know, he, he, he speaks, he just tells you that, see, if you do X, Y, Z, this is going to be the result. And, you know, of course, if you read the entire book of Proverbs, like, do this, you see this, you do this, you do that. If you don't walk according to Hokma, that's if you make foolish choices or bad choices or wrong or bad moral choices, then you will see this other kind of result you get. Um, so that's the communication of the book of, the book of um, Proverbs. Um, let's read two of them. Or a couple of them. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right? Train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right? Um, let's read Proverbs 10, 27. Proverbs 10, 27. It says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. I seen that. So that's the communication style where if you do this or you live like this, this will be the result. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind though is as you read Proverbs, you don't want to read it as a book of promises because even in your own life experience, you've seen it. There are children that were trained the way of the Lord, went out and started doing Illuminati music, <laughs> you know, or whatever. You get a lot of these gospel, a lot of these artists today in the world, you hear them. Oh, they started in church. They used to play instruments in church. Church is where they learned music. So um, that's just one example, but the idea is it is not every single person who is trained in the way he should go that does not depart from his when he's older. Do you get it? Um, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. There are good people who fear the Lord, who do the right things, but don't exactly live for long. There are wicked people who live up until 100 plus, right? It's not a... So it, Proverbs... That, and that's how that's the healthy way to interact with Proverbs. If you interact with it like a book of promises, or like you know, Proverbs also says that see as there a man diligent in business, he will stand before kings and not bear men. There are diligent people who are not standing before kings. And there are kings who are not diligent people. <laughs> you get like sometimes, and we will get into Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes sort of tries to introduce this other side of life to what Proverbs is saying. But Proverbs essentially communicates in this manner. So uh, but there is still wisdom, so it's not like Proverbs is the Proverbs is not naive. So I, I said I said um, online like last week, or I put out a tweet. I was saying that if you read the book of Proverbs right today, especially today, imagine the guy who wrote Proverbs was a person in our generation, and he used to tweet like this. They will come for him a lot. Why? Because Proverbs doesn't it doesn't introduce nuance to the conversation. He's very it sounds very naive, right? It's, it's not, there's no context, you know, not that, you know, you do not think about this context. You know the way we use Twitter these days now? You say something, there's somebody who will bring a context that had nothing to do with what you were saying, and then now construct an argument based on that context, and then that, you know, everything blows up. Like, this guy, no, con he just says it as, you know, boom. No nuance, no tact, nothing, just says it like that. Um, so, you, like I said earlier, it, the idea behind why Proverbs talks like this is that Proverbs, is telling you that, see, I've looked at life over a long period of time. These are the observations I've seen, that if people live like this, they are more likely to end up this way than that other way, right? So if you, for example, fear the Lord, you are more likely to live in a way that will not shorten your life. And of course, we are, we are all aware of ways that are outside the fear of the Lord that people can live that actually, you know, they will 
die quicker than they, than they ought to or than they should. So Proverbs should be treated like a book of ideals and possibilities. Or would I say normal cases where if you do X, Y, Z, this should happen. So if you jump, you will come down. Proverbs doesn't speak about escape velocity, for example. But if for most people, if most people jump, they are definitely going to come down. If a rocket goes up and it doesn't hit escape velocity, it's going to come down. So Proverbs is on that level and doesn't try to introduce all the edge cases and all the nuances and stuff, right? Um, and then Proverbs also speaks in like different kind of ways. One of the ways that Proverbs speaks is it can be suggestive or it, can, it will tell you how to live. Like, don't live like this, live like this. Uh, the other way is that sometimes it just is the fact and like, I'm done. So let's read four Proverbs. You, you see what I mean. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. Proverbs 16, 24. It says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So you see, this is just a fact. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Who's that? Right? Proverbs 20, 29. Proverbs 20, 29. He says, the glory of young men is in their strength, and the honor of old men is their gray hair. He's not telling you how to live. He's not telling you that's when you are old. If your hair is not gray, you should die. You get it. Just, it's telling you. You're just making a statement of fact. Right? Uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 17. Proverbs 10, 17 says, He's on the path of life who heeds instruction, but he who ignores reproof goes astray. This one is suggestive. Are you seeing that? It's telling you that. If you don't heed instruction, you are going the wrong path. And uh, the last one is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 9. Proverbs 13, 9. It says, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked goes out. You know, so if you are, again, from this, you can tell you that if you want the best for yourself, you better be righteous because um, the lamp of the wicked will go out. So they will die, more like saying they, they will die young. That's I saying that. Um, so the idea behind the book of Proverbs is to just arm you with like practical skills for living and, you know, telling you that if you want certain outcomes, there are ways that you can live that would guarantee or at least give you, a, not, not guarantee, sorry, that would give you a higher chance of reaching those desired outcomes that you want, right? So um, that's what the Proverbs generally are. But, you know, you don't, you, you most likely would not be expecting that an entire chapter of the book of Proverbs, for example, is talking about one subject and, you know, it all just makes coherent sense, like the whole chapter. Sometimes that's the case, um, not, not many times, but sometimes it looks like it's just random, random. Someone is just tweeting and tweeting and tweeting and tweeting and tweeting at you. you get uh -huh. So the final section, let me deal with the final section and then we move to the next book. Final section is in two chapters, chapter 30 and 31. Chapter 30 starts with a man who is named Agor, um, who begins by acknowledging his ignorance, right? And he, he also says, you know, he acknowledges that he needs God's wisdom, uh, right? But then the good thing about this man, Ago, is that he looks through the scriptures and then he now sees that, ah, there's actually the wisdom he needs is actually in the scriptures, right? So Proverbs presents Ago to us as the ideal reader of the book of Proverbs. So if you read the book of Proverbs, right, you will see that, ah, okay, yeah, there's actually wisdom. Um, I mean, this is not... You'll probably not get this on the screen, but I'll quickly just read um, chapter 30 of Proverbs. The first, like the, the early part. So open your Bible. Um, if you're not looking into your Bible, Proverbs chapter 30. Verse 1, it says, The words of our God, the son of Jacob, the oracle, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. Right? It says, who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who wrapped the waters in his hand? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Right? I see that too. He's describing. So look at how he's talking about wisdom. He's using creation. You guys, and when we get to Job, you say this also. Right? Um, he's using creation to describe. Because wisdom is what does. Is the, wisdom was the guy that handled creation. You get so in verse 5, he now says, though every word of God is tested, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add, do not add to his words or he will reprove you or you will be proved a, what, a liar. So um, that's clear from here. So this guy looks into the scriptures, sees wisdom, and the idea is for you to 
look at him and be like, oh, this is the ideal person, or this is the person that you will most likely be if you go through this book of Proverbs, right? And in the last chapter, very famous, Proverbs 31, verse 31 is a man named Lemuel who was a king, who was talking about the things his mother told him about a wise woman and how she lives. So uh, if you want to put everything together, the book of Proverbs opens with words from a father to his son about listening to Lady Wisdom, and then it closes by offering words from a mother to her son about a woman who lives according to wisdom. Right, so um, that's like what the that's what the book of Proverbs looks like. So you should, yeah, I want you to make a habit of actually reading, you know, integrate into it like your life. Maybe just while you commute or something, take one book of Proverbs, read the things that it says, meditate on the words. They are so powerful, and they are true. They are the word of God. Amen. You should live wisely in the fear of God. Amen. Let's go to Ecclesiastes now. Ecclesiastes is a, is a fairly interesting book. I, I know that many people don't go there. In your devotion, you hardly want to read from Ecclesiastes. Um, Ecclesiastes presents a... <laughs> I mean, you could almost think that this is a cynical, sad guy, right? Ecclesiastes is not very interested in making you happy. He's not the kind of, like... That's not how he's, how he's uh, projected to be. But um, let's look deeper in the book. Let's first talk about the... Who wrote the book, right? So the book of Ecclesiastes actually presents to us two different um, two different people. There are two voices in that book. There's the voice of the author and the voice of somebody called the preacher, right? If you read the book closely, you see that those are two different voices. So let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, for example. Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 2. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then he quotes the preacher. So you see, the person who is writing this is not the preacher. He's telling you what the words of the preacher were. Did you get it now? So he says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Right? Um, we would, I, I would examine this word vanity a little bit. But let's read another scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 to what? 14. Exodus 12, 9 to 14. He says, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. I see that this person speaking is not the preacher himself. So he says, the, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments. Right? I see that this is not the, it's not the preacher that's talking. Keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So that's the closing of the book. So the closing, the opening and the closing of the book will tell you that there's two characters involved here. There is the author and there is the preacher right those are two different people right um so like like i was saying earlier the book of ecclesiastes provides some sort of nuance to the things that the book of proverbs says so proverbs is the guy who says if you do x you will see y ecclesiastes is the guy who says well i know a few edge cases i've seen people who did x and got b they didn't get y right and um it's like there's a glitch in the matrix somewhere Something is wrong. So let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Just one example, just one example of this. Ecclesiastes 7, 7, 15. It says, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do you remember the proverb we just read not long ago that talks about the righteous man living long? Proverbs is saying, sorry, Ecclesiastes is saying, wait, I have seen everything, and I have seen a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. <laughs> I see that. And then he says, I've seen a wicked man who prolongs his life in wickedness. So something is up here. I've seen bad things happen to good people. I've seen good things happen to bad people. So is Proverbs lying? You know, if you fear the Lord and you walk according to wisdom, should you not, like, does it mean that you will not have these outcomes? Right, That's, so this is the thought that Ecclesiastes sort of tries to, you know, carry across. Now, there is a word that you will see a lot 
my translation says vanity. I think in Jesus also says vanity. I use NASB, New American Standard. Uh, but then you have NIV. NIV uses the word meaningless, right? Um, the Hebrew word is called hevel. It's H-E-V-E-L, hevel, right? Um, now, the challenge with language over time is that language changes in, in its use and its form. So hevel will literally refer to smoke or vapor, right? And if you think about vapor, there are two... But I say characteristics that will stand that will stand out to you. Number one is the fleeting nature of it. So it's here today, gone tomorrow. That kind of if somebody was smoking around you, for example, they would puff some smoke, and then you see it, and then it's gone. You get so that's like how vapor sort of that's the nature of vapor. The other nature, the other thing about um, vapor is that vapor can present to you some sort of paradox where it looks like a thing. It looks tangible until you try to grab it. And then it just, it just passes through, it just slips through your fingers. So it is these things that the author is trying to communicate. But you understand, you know, in language, it's hard to find one-to-one -one replacements for every word from the source language in the destination language. Very hard. So um, where NIV will say meaningless, right, um, we will say vanity. And in fact, the word vanity today, again, is the form or the use has changed. So if I tell you someone is vain, I'm either referring to the fact that they are excessively obsessive about how they look or you know what they are wearing or that kind of thing like you're just very vain right or it can also mean that they are futile like they are just doing things in vain i mean that is a very popular you know term that we use we are doing this in vain the idea is you are wasting your time okay, but so the the author of ecclesiastes is not saying that life is a waste of time i see that that's not the meaning but um, so, so the meaning is that it is those two things. I don't, there's no one word to use for those two things. But essentially, it is that life is fleeting, and life also presents a paradox where it feels like it's tangible, but when you try to grab it, it just goes away. And um, the entire message of Ecclesiastes is sort of like centered around this around this concept of vanity. So. I'll read you a verse from the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. So let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. It says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Right? And then the last at the end, you have Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 8. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. All is vanity, sorry. I say that. So open and close of the book. So it just tells you that everything we do is sort of to be read in light of this. Now let's go into the meat of the book. Now, the preacher tries to tell you about this vanity or this heaven in three different ways. Three sad ways. One is that time passes and really a man's existence in the grand scheme of things doesn't change much, right? Uh, the second one is that we are going to die someday. That's, that makes you happy, Abby. The third one is chance. It's like, man, this thing, sometimes people do stuff and it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So he explores the idea of vanity in these three concepts right and uh, so let's just read scriptures Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 4 to 11 Ecclesiastes 1 4 to 11 it says a generation comes a generation goes but the earth remains forever also the sun rises and the sun sets and hastening to his place it rises there again blowing towards the south then toward the north the wind continues swirling around and on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this? It's new. Already it has existed for ages, which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the latter things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance, 
among those who, who will come later still. So it just talks about the passage of time. And in this context, vanity. Like time is vanity. Time will just go whether we like it or not. Right. Um, let's look at the idea of death. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19 to 22. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 22. It says, For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath. And there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of beast descends downward to the earth. I have seen that nothing is better than man should be happy in his activities. For that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Are you seeing that? So... That idea that everybody is going to die one day, right? It's part of what it's part of what he tries to express with his vanity concepts. Ecclesiastes chapter nine verse two. He says, "It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked. So, righteous, so wicked, oh, we're gonna die. For the good, for the clean, and for the unclean. So, wicked, clean, unclean, gonna die." For the man who offers a sacrifice and the one who does not sacrifice. As, for the, as the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. So whether you live righteous or not, you're going to die. Whether you live well or not, you're going to die. Whether you offer sacrifice to God or not, you're going to die. Either way, we are all going to die. Right? That's the common denominator between man and beast. <laughs> wow, that's so motivating. You feel energized. <laughs> Yeah. The third concept is the concept of chance. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. It says, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, and the battle is not to the warriors, and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. So he's saying that he's noticed something, right? You know, I know a lot of times we use this scripture to talk about, you know, it's not about your efforts, God will show you favor and all those things. Yeah, I get it. But in context of like what he's talking about here, he's saying that people who are swift run and still don't win the race for some reason. So in the context of everything we're talking about, you understand what this is saying now, is that sometimes, you know, things don't just work according to plan, right? Life can happen. You planned to be here by six o'clock. So you woke up by five, had your bath, and you were ready to leave your house by 5.15. In 45 minutes, ideally, you should get here. But for some reason, today, right, what happened was on the way here, your vehicle broke down. And, you know, you still had some minutes to spare, but on the way here, then you realize you forgot your phone at home, so you had to go back. So you see how, even though you did everything right, you woke up early, you ironed yesterday, you made sure your shoes were clean, you made sure everything was okay, you made all the plans. Woke up today and voila, everything is changed, right? Life just happened, right? That's the idea of, of this. So it's just chance. Somebody does something, it works today. Somebody does the same thing, it doesn't work tomorrow. That is the idea of chance, right? Good. So now in, the, in this whole book of Ecclesiastes, another thing that the author tries to do for us, this one, may lead, it may look subtle, but you have to be, if you are observant, you'll see it. What he also tries to do is, it tries to explore all the ways that we seek to make meaning out of life. And it just tells you everything is vanity. So Proverbs, on one hand, looks at all these areas of life and is telling you, you know, if you do this, you will see this. If you do this, you will see that, right? Exactly is saying, man, you will work. And then it's possible that at the end of the day, after all your hustle, you are handing over your wealth to somebody who's going to squander it. <laughs> like, hey, that's life. <laughs> you get so... Ecclesiastes is saying that, well, yeah, Proverbs is correct, but I've seen people whose experience is the opposite, right? He's talked about pleasure as well. So, yeah, you think pleasure is going to satisfy you. Yeah, go and be happy and be merry and stuff. You know, do TGIF. Monday is going to come. You get. Um, so, he talks about wealth, work, and all that. So, Ecclesiastes also touches, but his lens is a little bit different. Ecclesiastes is the one who is considering all the edge cases, right? That's good to know. In all of this, 
there is a so somebody might ask me now so why so if this book is this sad why does it exist in the bible right what's the point why are you just trying to ruin my book right. um now in all of this at the point of ecclesiastes one of the points that ecclesiastes tries to make is that the fact that life is vanity or that you know everything is vain in, in his words right should encourage you to actually enjoy life today right um so one may think that you know if you think about life as vanity and all of that you'll be depressed and all the guy encourages you to say like see let me tell you the truth here. life if you if you enjoy if you ever have any room to enjoy in your life is a gift from god <laughs> so you better enjoy yourself properly so let's read a few scriptures ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 to 13 Ecclesiastes 3, 11 to 13. He says, He has made everything appropriate in his time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, because it's the gift of God. I see that. So this idea of gift of God is repeated. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. 16 to 18. Ecclesiastes 5, 16 to 18, he says, This is also a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the winds? So why, why are you hustling? Right? And, you know, you're toiling for the winds like you're hustling and everything just blowing away. Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Here's what I have seen to be good and fitting. To eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life, which God has given him. For this is his reward. I think that. Good. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 14 to 15. Ecclesiastes 8, 14 to 15. He says, There is futility which is done on the earth, that is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. I think that. <laughs> Bad things happening to good people. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility, or is what? Vanity. So I commend pleasure. <laughs> for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. So, in all the hardship of life, if you have room to enjoy, take it. Of course, in the fear of the Lord. Let your pleasure, I, I, I think we'll, we'll still look at that. But yeah, let your pleasure still be within the confines of the fear of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. All right. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 3 to 9. He says, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely, a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Go then, eat your bread in happiness, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time. Let not oil be lacking on your head. No, use... Hair product. <laughs> Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, <laughs> which he has given you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil, which you have labored under the sun. Are you seeing that? So, this theme of, see, this life is fine, so just enjoy. It's actually repetitive. Um, I'll, give, I'll read the last one because I think I've made the point. But Ecclesiastes chapter 11, 7 to 10. He says, The light is pleasant and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all. Let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet, I see this, yet, <laughs> know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So, no, <laughs> responsibly. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Are you seeing that? So in the light of all of this, life is heaven. 
you know, um, good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. Life can be unpredictable. We are all going to die. Time is going to pass regardless of what you do. And your actions don't really change the grand scheme of things. What is the thing that we are to do in the light of all this? Um, the author tells us at the end. We read it before, but let's read it again. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 9 to 14. He says, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge and he pondered, searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought out to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads and masters of these collections are, well, are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Right, so the conclusion, when all has been heard, is, what's the conclusion? Fear God and keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, and everything which is seen, whether it is good or evil. So, the author looks back at everything the preacher has said, and he's telling you, right, that, you know, it's going to be very exhausting if you try to, you know, you're looking through books, you're trying to answer why to everything right uh, but the idea or what you are supposed to do is you should fear god keep his commandments right because it applies to every person now that sounds like proverbs i think that because that's still what is constant at the end of the day right and so he introduces another component which is still the way of wisdom he says for god will bring every act to judgment and everything which is hidden whether it is good or evil so ecclesiastes says fine i've added a lot of nuance but you still, but Proverbs is still correct. So he's not trying to negate Proverbs. He just gives you more perspective. So if you only read, if you walk entirely just with what Proverbs says, you only have one side of the equation. You might grow up naive and you'll be born too many times. You'll be sad. People will break your heart. Somebody has been dating you three years, promise you to marry you. And then you break your heart, <laughs> you know. Um, people will disappoint you. They will promise you something, money, whatever. They will fail, right? Um, I read from childhood for many of us, your parents, you wanted to go out to your parents. So they said, go in and take your shoes. And then before you came back, they ran away. <laughs> Most of us experienced that, right? So yeah, you'll be born 20 times, right? You will do that. Ah, but the child has not sinned. What did I do to deserve this? Nothing. It's just life. Life happens. All right. Cool. So that's the word of Ecclesiastes there. Ecclesiastes introduces nuance to the conversation. But in the end, you still have to fear God because that's what is constant and that's what's consistent. And you have to believe in God's justice, which is still the way of wisdom. Right. Amen. Now to the final book in our discussion today. Job is an interesting book for various reasons. One is Job and the characters in the book are not Israelites, right? Uh, we also don't know in what time period they existed, right? We also see that they are somewhere in the land of Uz. So there's a lot of detail that we don't have about the book, but um, if you understand the way the Bible authors wrote, you will know that um, sometimes they just try to not make you focus on what is not important. So for example, reading Genesis, did Adam have a belly button? If he was not born, like, yeah, yeah, no placenta, so what happened? They didn't tell you that. There's no answer to that. Did you get it? <laughs> what kind of leaves? Does the Bible actually tell you the kind of leaves God used to clothe Adam? I'm not sure he told you the kind of tree. I'm not sure. I don't remember now. But point is, there's a lot of detail that you don't have because they want you to focus on the point. Uh, so let's read Job chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Job chapter 1, verse 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Notice how he was described. He was blameless, he was upright, he feared God and he turned from evil. Very important. So, from what we see here, he, I, mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, pay attention to the way Job is described, right? Pay attention. He was blameless, he was upright, he feared God and he turned from evil. Are you saying that fear God, turn from evil? It sounds like Proverbs, Abi. Uh -huh. So, he feared God, turn from evil. Now, if you just go down from verse 8 to 10, 
He says, the Lord said to Satan. So what happened is God was doing roll call of all his, you know, of heavenly hosts. And some guy called the Satan, Satan, shows up in the midst. And then God is the one who initiates the conversation. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? Like, hey, God. <laughs> I was like, God, don't recommend me. <laughs> have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has? On every side, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. So, Proverbs was working for Job. I seen that Proverbs, Job did well. He was blessed, right? I don't know why. You know, Satan was just going on his own. And then God now called for, <laughs> God now <laughs> used the guy to, <laughs> God now recommended the guy. As a, you know, have you tried this guy? You know, this kind of recommendation is when you need job, you should be getting it. It's not to sit and really recommending you. But point is, this happens with Job. And we are not exactly told why God did this. Because it's very important. And, you know, if you read the book of Job, right, um, the book of Job sort of tries, it ends up not answering the question of why did this happen to Job. Because what happened in the rest of his story is that God says, you know what, you can go afflict him. Let's see what he does, right? Satan is sure that he would rebel against God. So, in the same day, he loses everybody he has and everything he has. Same day, right? And then in chapter 2, you know, God came up again and said, well, have you seen my servant Job? <laughs> you tried him and he didn't sin against me. And Satan is like, well, uh, I didn't touch his body. So, you know, he's still convenient. He still has, he's still fine. So God is like, yeah, touch his body, but don't kill him. I'm like, she mean, the, the first time you saw that, it, like, you could have just paused. But God said, no. So, yes. Uh, Satan got to afflict him again, and then he entered serious suffering. Now, in the first round of suffering he got in chapter 1, verse 20 to 21, the Bible says, look at Job's response. The Bible says, Job rose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground, and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. This naked I came, naked I right on. Do you remember it from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, actually? So it says, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job is speaking in Ecclesiastes terms, saying that, you know, yeah, I came naked, I'm going naked, and all that stuff. Good. And the Bible actually also tells us that Job fell on his face and worshipped God when all these things happened to him. Such a, such a spiritual man. Many of us will not respond like that in today's world. Uh, but yeah, Job fell on his face and worshipped. So wow, powerful, right? Good. And then the rest of the book explores how this man goes through a meltdown. So after worshipping, we now see him go through five stages of grief. The very next chapter is cursing the day he was born. Because <laughs> he spent a whole, he, he wrote an, ex, he, he gave an extensive, extensive curse on the day he was born. Right. And now let's get to the meat of the book. The, the, myth of, the myth of the book is this. Job stands and says, I have done nothing wrong, so what I'm going through cannot be divine judgment. If this is happening to me, is either God is not just, or I don't know. You get it. Job's friends are like, nope, God is just. So, for this to be happening to you, it must be divine judgment and you must have done something wrong. So that's, that's the argument that his friends brought. And then the, a very good percentage of the book is them just going back and forth, back and forth on these ideas. Job will speak and say he's innocent and all that stuff. His friends will say no. His friends even made up hypothetical sins that he created. Like maybe you just did something. Like if you just be humble and just repent, you'll be fine. Because Proverbs is true. Yeah, they're like, ah, if you live well, you will you you see you see good things now. Right? Why are you why are you behaving as if you, because they are of the opinion that God is just and it's true. Job also agrees with them that God is just. It's just that he's like, if this is happening to me and I did not do anything wrong and I do not deserve this, then this is not justice. So what the undertone of everything is that God's justice is being called into, into question 
And this is what happens to all of us when we go through hard times, when we suffer. Like Job is all of us. I mean, we don't, God forbid, we will not go through something this terrible. But Job is all of us. You get Job is the one who sees the contract, like, like, like we see the contradictions in life. You get we see, we, we put all the effort into something and it doesn't go well, right? Or we, you know, yeah, we, we, we are the righteous people, but why do we have these problems? Why do the sinners not have these problems, right? So Job is the one, is, is the story of somebody living through the contradiction, in quotes, of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Remember I told you it's not a contradiction, but just for the sake of communication. It's just living through that paradox of what's happening. So, anywho, um, one of his friends, Job's friends, comes around and says, well, um, let me introduce a bit of nuance here. So, it might not be that God is punishing you. It might just be that God is trying to, you know, get something across to you. And that's where he talks about how, you know, a man is sleeping and God will see the instruction in his ears. God will give him a dream in the night and all of those things. Now, Job did not even answer him. <laughs> I don't know why, but Job did answer him. So, the next thing that happens is Job now starts, he now says, you know what? I'm done with you guys. I'm not even talking to you. Then he faces God and he starts to call God into question. Say, God should come and defend himself. Like, I didn't do anything wrong, so you have to come and answer me personally. You know, it sounds like somebody, somebody I heard recently, although it's not Job. That one. <laughs> anyway, let me not digress. <laughs> but yeah, Job, Job said God should come and answer. So God showed up as he demanded. And what God did, if you read Job, like the latter parts of Job, God did not come and answer like, oh, this is why you are suffering. So God didn't tell him what happened with Satan. No, that's not, that's not what God did. God just started to list everything in creation. Were you there when the earth was this? When the stars were this? Were you there when all of this was happening? You know, it, it goes from the sky to the land to the things under the land. It mentions the, everything, like everything that creation all the details that you would have missed, you know, even goes into detail of how the mountain goats feed, you know, goes like a lot of detail on how the cosmos is organized and all that stuff. And what God tries to show Job is that you are, you are looking at life from the standpoint of just your own existence, right? But your viewpoint is too small. So you can't be the one telling me what the ideas are for what is justice and what is not justice. I see that. So, in suffering, remember when you are about to call God into question. Now, because sometimes there are things that you do wrong and then you see the consequence of your actions. But sometimes, to be honest, it's not as if you did something wrong. Okay. And I like to say this, that any, any reading of the book of Job that leads you to conclude that Job was to blame for his actions eh, is a self-righteous reading. You are being self-righteous. A certain, you know, certain groups of Christianity will say things like, Job made a statement that the things he feared came upon him. So that's what opened the door for Satan. No, like the book doesn't say that. There is no construct, like there's nothing in the book that suggests that. Right? The Bible says, remember the description, I said you should pay attention in, in the beginning. They described, Job was described as an upright man. Right? As a righteous man who was blameless and feared God. Even God boasted. Some people say Job, God was trying to teach Job humility because he was self-righteous because of all the statements he made. He was not self-righteous. God himself said this person is blameless and upright and turns from evil and there's nobody like him in all the earth. So the book does not actually answer what the reason for Job's suffering is. What the book tells us at the end is that God is just and the idea of justice is complex. God even challenged Job. You know, God even said, okay, let me put you in charge of this thing for a day. Exalt all the, you know, low people. Bring down all the proud people. Let's see how you do it. Administer justice. So God's response to Job was not really to answer what caused his suffering. God's response to Job was, I am just. I am bigger than you. <laughs> right? And, you know, justice is not, you are too small. You got, there, there's many moving parts to the world, right? There's a God, I am God, and you are not him. So you can't be the habitat of, you know, of justice. You can't, right? And um, at the end of the day, how the book ends is that Job repents, right? And then God, the book doesn't stop there, actually. So after, God repent, after Job repents, then God comes and turns to his friends, and God says, yeah, all of you are saying nonsense. You are wrong. 
interestingly, God, God did not also answer Elihu. I don't know why. <laughs> like Elihu just came and spoke and nobody answered. God didn't answer. Job's friends didn't answer. Job didn't answer. <laughs> nobody answered him. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, but then God said that Job spoke well. Interestingly, Job that, if you read the things he said, he almost blasphemed. Almost. <laughs> like he was on the edge like this, but he didn't blaspheme. But God said, and I, I believe it was God just acknowledging his honesty because in all of that, he still came and was still talking. At least he was still talking to God. Yes. So I think it was God just acknowledging his honesty and his vulnerability with him. So um, now with these three books, I think you, if you put all these three books together, you start to see the full picture, right? Job experienced Proverbs. He also experienced Ecclesiastes, right? And the, the, the concept of fearing God and living according to wisdom is what ties these three books together, right? That's what Proverbs tells you. That's what Ecclesiastes tells you. That's what Job also tells you. To fear God and live according to wisdom. Now, at the end of the whole thing in the book of Job, God restored everything double to Job. Now, again, you see that that restoration wasn't because of anything. It wasn't a reward. Okay, so it's not like, oh, because he did right, he was blessed twice of what he lost. No. God just did it to him. God just gave it to him as a gift. You get like, yeah, it's just this. Does it mean, of course, it doesn't mean that in life, just, you know, just be, just be low far about life. No, that, that's not what he means. What, he, what he's just telling you there is, Proverbs is correct, right? Because Job was experiencing Proverbs to the point where God put a hedge of protection around him. Ecclesiastes is correct because he also experienced Ecclesiastes. He did nothing wrong. God himself was the one who initiated the conversation with Satan. I've seen that. And in the end, the conclusion from Job is that God is just and you should fear him and respect yourself. <laughs> I'll say it like that. Respect, you, you, you know, have honor God. Have respect for the complexity of wisdom because what God came to show him in all that talking about the way the world works and all those things is wisdom. It's the wisdom that we saw in Proverbs. It's the wisdom that we saw in Ecclesiastes. So God is, so the idea is that in suffering, always remember that God is wise and God is just. Are you seeing that? So just as Ecclesiastes also encouraged you at the end that, you know what? Remember to follow God, have the fear of the Lord, shun evil, and God will judge everything. It's the same, it's the same hope that the book of Job is trying to communicate to you. Amen. Cool. Um, I will stop here today. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, but if there's any, please, you can send us an email. Um, let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today's teaching. We thank you for your words that has come forth in clarity, in boldness, in accuracy, in wisdom and power. Lord, I ask for everyone that when the times, when times are hard, you will help us to keep our minds fixed on your justice and your wisdom and help us trust, O oh God, that in your wisdom, you have our lives figured out and you know what is to come and that in your, that in your righteousness, you will judge all things in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, and amen.